Professor Johann Fagan, thank you for being with us this morning. It's a pleasure. And you've made amazing um, progress with your textbooks and changed learning in a, in a very a meaningful way. Can you tell us about it, please? Essentially, um, I'm the head of the ENT department um, at Goerenskeer Hospital and the University of Cape Town. And uh, we have, over the years, been training colleagues from other African countries. And this has made us aware of the, of the dire financial straits that they often find themselves in. It me, and me, of me to the thought that perhaps we should be making our ear, nose and throat textbooks open access. Um, I did approach two very senior authors, uh, uh, one, one in America and one, one in the UK, about, uh, about taking some of the old textbooks which are out of print and making these open access and they both agreed. We then met with the publishers who then turned us down for, for obvious reasons. And so I then simply set about starting to write a textbook, um, chapter by chapter, which we released as PDF files on the UCT Zobula uh, website. So it was really a financial reason that you saw an opportunity to go open? It, it was initially f for financial reasons. Um, but the textbooks have taken on a life of their own and they've now really become extremely popular. Um, the two textbooks, uh, the one uh, focuses on how to do operations. It's called the Open Access Atlas of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Operative Surgery. And the other focuses on, on how to do hearing tests and how to fit hearing aids. And these textbooks have now, the chapters from these textbooks have now been downloaded uh, almost a quarter million times. Yeah. Um, and, um, and while we're sitting here, there's a chapter being downloaded every two minutes. That's incredible. And you said even yesterday there were yesterday, amazing statistics coming out. Yeah, uh, well I checked yesterday before the interview and, uh, and, and we had over 700 chapters downloaded in a 24-hour cycle. And it's coming from almost every country in the world. Um, the biggest users at the moment appear to be South Africa and the United Kingdom and the USA followed by, by India. And um, what's remarkable is how the internet crosses boundaries. Um, and at the height of the Syrian war, we had downloads coming from Damascus. So there was obviously one surgeon or doctor in Damascus who required some information and was, and was downloading information as to how to do surgery. And how did these people hear about your um, textbooks? Her website, also through the UCT textbooks, are actually maintained on that website. Um, but it's just amazing how, how when you put a chapter on the internet, um, how within a few weeks it creeps up, up to the first page of Google. And quite a number of our chapters now are right at the top of Google, in fact. And of course, once you reach that point, then it gets hit more and more. And the effect of the connectivity of internet and the networks coming in. Yes, and, um, and the book's also cited on quite a few other, other websites as well. Right. I don't exactly know how Google how Google sort of works and how it ranks um, 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 hits. Um, but I think there's been an optimization process being done by the UCT OER department as well in terms of our website, which I'm sure has made a difference too. You mentioned uh, an incentive to write these books for open access that um, the African countries need more textbooks. What responses have you had from the African countries? We've had wonderful responses, and um, there are many, many countries where, well, well, India for one, I've been told that it's now become the standard text for the for the trainees. I've had a, had a response from uh, from Dundee in Scotland, where where the head of uh, one of the senior the senior doctors there says it's now compulsory reading before for all all operations for the for the trainees. Um, so it's really become a standard text all around the world. Yeah. And the African countries where there are very few ENT surgeons, I hear you've had responses from them too. We have had. Um, there are some countries like Malawi has only one ENT surgeon, and, um, and, and, and this is probably why, why, why um, Africa doesn't rank that highly in terms of, um, um, of countries using the textbook. But most certainly countries like Nigeria and so on, it's become a standard text and it's been used, um, used, used both by, by the trainees and the, uh, the qualified doctors as well. Yeah. 
it sounds amazing and it no doubt has taken a lot of effort from, on your part. Can you share with us what this has meant to you? Well, it's been very exciting because it's, um, well, firstly, I think it's, it's a very important philanthropic um, sort of process and, um, and it's also been quite remarkable how, how much support I've received from colleagues all over the world. Um, you know, um, our job really as academics is to generate knowledge and to distribute it and uh, we don't get paid to publish in journals or to publish in textbooks and so, um, so it's not surprising that my colleagues all around the world have, have really rallied to my support. Um, I have, have some of the top ear surgeons and the top sinus surgeons and the top head and neck surgeons around the world for writing for free. And um, to the extent that I've now been approached by colleagues, colleagues have brought, brought to us parts that they can contribute. I have colleagues in, in France who have now agreed to translate all the textbook into French. Um, I was approached by a colleague in Portugal who's translating it into Portuguese. So it's really taken, taken on a life of its own and um, it's, it's become a very, uh, it has become a very, very exciting and a very, very sort of global project. What's also appealing about this form of textbook is it can be updated regularly. So, um, yeah, and we do that regularly. You know, we, we'll modify five chapters. Um, um, if we take new, new photographs of, uh, of operations, we might, might, might change, it, change the photographs. And, um, and so from that perspective, the perspective compared to a, a, um, a a formal textbook, um, it really is quite an exciting concept. So it's a growing document, it's a growing work of um, academic expertise rather than something that is published and then static in a way. And that's There's also been, been, been interesting special. about this, uh, this book is that, uh, that unlike a textbook that you have to complete before you publish it, here we, we simply keep, keep, keep um, adding new chapters. So if you're going to take on a project like this, you don't need to complete the textbook before you, before you actually launch it on the internet. So we started with one chapter and then keep on adding, and now we're up to about 80 chapters in total, and we're probably only about two-thirds of the way. When I was looking at it, I, I noticed how some chapters were available, others weren't, but it was quite clear for everyone what was coming. And so opening up that process was very special and also the multiple authors in the different um, articles. I could see, see it was a very much a, a work in progress and very much collaborative. Absolutely, and, um, you know, and it's been very exciting to be able to source, source experts you know, um, in various areas all around the world. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, we know that the, the certain types of cancer are most, most common in India, so we go and, go and find Indian surgeons who's going to write about that. Well, there's certain tech, you know, certain techniques are done uh, in certain countries, and, uh, and we're going to go and, go and target those authors. So you can really get the get the get the very very best to write write on the topic. And taking that advantage of the globalized network. Absolutely. Amazing. Any challenges you've had with developing this incredible product? Well, the challenge has been time. Um, it is time consuming and I've done all the editing myself as well. You know, how to, and how to use uh, software programs, um, which, is, which is really quite simple once to, to get around that. Um, we've also um, had, had, had to address questions around, um, around copyright of, of, of illustrations. But we focus very much on taking photographs rather than, than using, using illustrations to keep the cost down. And your own photographs? Our own very photographs, often. our own photographs. Yes. And, um, and where we do use illustrations, we relied quite heavily on the very old copies of Grey's Anatomy, which are now copyright expired. Um, we, the, the books have also been registered with the Creative Commons. And the Creative Commons license that we've applied for, um, or, or that applies, um, essentially means that you can copy, paste, you can use the material freely, other than for commercial reasons. So uh, we're only too pleased if um, if educators around the world will, will use our illustrations for, for teaching purposes or even, even in lectures. And that is a very open type of license where you're just saying we don't want you to make profits from our work, we just want attribution. Absolutely. And I wouldn't even, even be, 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 be so too concerned, concerned, if, uh, concerned if I didn't get attribution as long as the material is being used. Mm. There are some arguments about 
quality and peer review, but it sounds from what you're saying that, they that you've been using real experts in the field. The yeah, peer review and quality is, is clearly, uh, clearly a very big challenge now, now in the internet sort of world that we're living in. Uh, we see this also with the, uh, with the very many new open access journals which are coming to the fore. And I am sometimes concerned about the, about the level of, of, of the peer review that's, uh, uh, that exists um, with those journals and publications. And of course, um, um, so YouTube tube is awash uh, with videos from all around the world on how to do, do certain operations and procedures, and one has no idea what the quality is like. Um, that's why we've relied on trying to handpick experts in the field and relying on so so-called expert uh, expert knowledge or expert opinion, um, and we've been very careful from that perspective. Excellent. Thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to add to share with others? Um, yeah, I believe that uh, that UCT should most certainly be promoting. A, open access um, so resources for a student body. Um, it, uh, firstly, it's a wonderful marketing tool for UCT. Um, secondly, um, um, textbook inflation has outstripped um, normal inflation almost threefold since the 1980s and textbooks are simply becoming unaffordable. And thirdly, the, the UCT um, does make, make a great deal of funding available for student support. Um, it would make far more sense to, to allocate some of this funding to actually developing open educational resources um, that, uh, for a student body, uh, they've, thereby reducing the need for, for these subsidies to the, to the interested students. Yes. And it would also mean that the material was accessible to the students even maybe before they came to UCT. Absolutely. If it was freely available. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a very important point could prepare them better, they would have more access. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And what about incentives for um, academics? Because as you said, you've put a lot of time into it. What do you think can encourage other academics to make this great effort that you've made? This is something which universities will have to grapple with. We, uh, we all know that, uh, that the academic currency of universities um, 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 our publications in peer-reviewed journals, so citations, and and um, and postgraduate qualifications. Um, so I'm not quite certain how the universities are going to deal with these open educational resources, but they have to find an answer for that, because this is the way of the future. And just finally, for you as an acad academic, the top of your field, head of the ENT department, what has this project meant for you? From my perspective, um, um, I think it's, it's been extremely uh, um, exciting um, at many levels, uh, but mainly the fact that, that we've been able to bring, bring information uh, as to how to do, do surgery, how to, how to improve the quality of surgery uh, to the most, most remote parts of the world uh, where, where colleagues and doctors um, either can't afford, afford access to the educational resources um, or simply don't have access to them. And you also mentioned your name getting known and connecting with people that you wouldn't otherwise have connected with. Yes, uh, 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 and through the textbook now, uh, through UCT's name, as well as the, uh, that of the authors and the editors, which includes myself, you know, is now, now known all around the world, including countries like Vietnam and, um, and, um, and Nepal and the, most remote, uh, the most, most remote parts of the world. And so, as I said earlier, I think from a marketing perspective, I think it's, it's, it's outstanding both from an institutional perspective as well as a, as a personal sort of perspective. Well, thank you. And where, where do you go from here? Uh, from here, um, I'm, I'm, uh, my next project, which we're really engaging in, is to create um, an, an, an internet-based um, so curriculum um, for for ENT T, uh, clinical offices around Africa, and I'm working with colleagues from Kenya and Malawi on this, and um, hopefully that will be that will be forthcoming coming in the, in the near future, and also be hosted on the UCT website. Is that an online course? Online course. Where you'll have videos and then practical. Yeah, yeah probably mainly in terms of text um, and and the recommended videos because there are, are many videos out there already we can we can call on.
thank you very much. Thank you. Sounds an amazing project and good luck with it.